Hello, I'm Neil Sang. I'm a researcher in geographical information science at the Department of Landscape Architecture, Planning and Management at SLU in Sweden. And I'm the leader for Work Package 6, Modelling MBS, in the Horizon 2020 project, NICE. To start with a brief overview of the project itself, we're in the second year of a four year project, the overall goal of which is to improve efficiency within the urban water cycle by using NBS to recycle, clean and allow reuse of grey water for purposes such as um, watering green infrastructure, that kind of thing. There are 14 partners to the project and seven urban real labs. The role of the urban real labs is to take the knowledge generated in the project and test it in situ in various contexts around the world. The experimental work and the urban real lab in situ plots, they provide information which would allow the dimensioning of solutions with respect to certain kinds of pollution, certain volumes, and so on. But it leaves open the question of how you select between those solutions and how you connect them together into bigger systems that might be applied at a range of scales from individual buildings to city blocks, to sub catchments in urban areas or to entire catchments. That complexity needs to be managed and to bridge across to the scientific knowledge. That's the purpose of the modeling software. The gap to be bridged is not just in terms of scale, chaining together known models and seeing what the net effect is. It's also bridging towards the way that could be used. So the consultants who will be delivering the services, the planners and the um, utility managers and so on who will be commissioning these and deciding whether or not to install them, whether or not they can go with an MBS solution or they need to stay with a traditional solution. And that also means interacting with a different user group with different needs. So we had a survey on their user requirements, asking them about what kinds of pollution they're trying to deal with, sure, but also asking them about what kind of access to data they have. Can they parameterize our models? Can they access geodata to do that at larger scales? Do they have the skill sets to do that? And when it comes to using the results, are they used to working with databases and GIS? If not, what are they used to working with? The survey we ran to gather information about this is a little bit biased towards higher education and consulting, but we did get responses from municipalities, water utilities and others. And we developed a lot of interesting insight from that, which has really influenced how the software will look, which I'll come on to later. But also, importantly, it influences the way we actually constructed the core model. So we're not going with a simulated approach where we try to simulate the biophysical mechanisms. Why? Well, those models already exist. They're quite difficult to build um, and quite difficult to parameterize and potentially take longer simulation times. So they're not suitable for, for a design context, really. Instead, we try to emulate the effect. So we have a statistical model from the field work, from the experimental data, that says how much of an impact a given MBS with given dimensions will have. And then we apply that. So if we've got a certain loading, what does the water look like when it comes out the other side in terms of each relevant pollution? At the simplest level, this could just be a rule of thumb. It could be that 
you have experienced that typically a device would remove say 20% of the organic matter at each step. That's useful if you're parameterizing things from expert knowledge and from experience rather than from data. It's useful if you want to combine a set of devices into one larger device and then represent that as a single device, which is handy if you're scaling things up. It's handy if you want to understand the likely potential discharge should there be an overflow at each step. But the complexity isn't coming from how you're representing the MBS device itself and its internal mechanisms. The complexity is coming from what happens when you test lots of combinations of things in a larger system. On the other hand, assuming a consistent level of efficiency is all very well when you have a device which is well understood and well managed. But when you have more complex devices, particularly larger ones, outdoors, constructed wetlands are a good example of this, they can respond differently depending on levels of saturation, how much water has already passed through, are they just being set up, is there, is there some early discharge which is less fully treated, they may respond differently in different temperatures, they may respond differently if the, the plants that are growing react to certain pH levels in the water. So the management of that device might be relevant. And therefore we have built in the ability to represent different types of regression functions that convert an input loading to an output based on a range of different conditions that might change over time. This is also useful from the point of view of people who are doing experimental data to understand how a new system might work because typically you're producing a time series of outputs and inputs and connecting those two together through a regression. So we're reflecting the way the science works but we're also compressing that into something that the end user will be able to look at without necessarily having to fully parameterize the regression equation. But regardless of how complex a response function an individual device has, you could argue that both of those could be calculated in, a, in an Excel spreadsheet for one device. The real complexity comes when you start to put those devices together into larger systems and you start to put them into an actual landscape. So their response needs to reflect their position. The loadings need to reflect their position. That could be in terms of rainfall patterns. It could be in terms of diffuse sources, how much pollution is coming off different agricultural lands. It could be in terms of the demographics in the area and what kind of households there are. It could be in terms of what kind of local industry there is. Those are the things setting the loadings, but also potentially setting things like probable temperatures and, and other parameters. So to make this useful, you need to be able to extract that kind of information relatively easily. Which brings me to the user interface. What will this look like? Well, the main model, the engine, is written in the programming language R, but the end user would never really need to see that. Only scientific users who are actually creating their own bespoke MBS devices might want to do so. The user interface, it was quite clear from the survey, needed to be a spreadsheet. Databases and so on would be considered a barrier to use. So that for a simple model based around individual buildings, it would be entirely feasible to only interact via a spreadsheet. If you're working at a larger spatial scale, there will also be a QGIS interface, which will allow pre-populating that spreadsheet from spatial data. 
but it's the spreadsheet that ultimately goes into the database in the software and drives the model. So from the point of view of a typical end user who wants to select some MBS that they're going to try and test against different scenarios, they basically have one table and each row in that table is a step in the network along which the water flows, picking up pollutants and then being cleaned via the nature-based solutions. Starting off with cases, which are loadings going into the system. These are collected together at, at confluence points into tanks and then fed through the nature-based solution. The nature-based solutions are picked from that back database where NICE as a project is populating it with various devices. But when the project ends, there's no reason why others cannot continue to populate that. If it's a sophisticated device, they'll need to do that through R. But if it's a rule of thumb device, they can actually do that through the MBS device tab within Excel as well. And then although it's not a core part of the main function, we also recognize from the survey a desire to look at co-benefits. So there is the option to include a ratio table for co-benefits. So this is only a basic ratio between the amount of a given pollutant processed by a particular MBS and what is implied in terms of carbon sequestration or biomass production or something like that. It's a simple ratio, but it does allow some recognition of the additional co-benefits of an MBS to be factored into this overall system for decision making. Okay, that's enough from me. If you want to get involved, as I said, the beta panel is at a stage now where we would be welcoming stakeholders beyond the, the consortium. So if you're interested in that, then send me an email. Alternatively, there will be a pre-release stage where we need people to, to test the software. Is it useful for you? So if that's of interest, then you could let me know and I'll hold on to your your name. Or if this isn't you yourself, but you have a stakeholder in mind, then do let us know who that might be and put us in touch. Okay, thank you for listening.